More than evolution, did Darwin make atheism credible? My name's Richard Buggs and I'm an evolutionary biologist and also a Christian. And so this question of whether or not Darwin makes atheism credible is something I've, that I've thought about a great deal over the last 25 or so years. And the conclusion that I've come to is that Darwin doesn't make atheism any more credible than it was before. And in this short talk, I'm going to explain to you why I think that is. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not here to say evolution doesn't happen. I'm not to say that Darwin's mechanism of natural selection isn't a very powerful mechanism. I'm here to say that Darwinian evolution is simply not sufficient to explain the world and its complexity to a great enough extent to preclude the existence of God. And here's how I want to argue that to you. Long before Darwin, back in the time of the ancient Greeks, Socrates would look at a statue and he would say, look at that beautiful statue. As you look at that, don't you admire the skill and the artistry of the sculpture who made that statue? You infer that he must have been very intelligent, that he had a purpose, that he planned out this statue and that he executed it with great skill. Well, Socrates said, now look at an actual human body and how much more complex, how much more beautiful, how much more skillfully made is a human body than a statue which is merely mimicking it. And this was the beginnings of a very famous argument called the argument for design for God's existence. And it's an argument that really just extrapolates from our everyday experiences. A couple of weeks ago it snowed and I went out for a walk in Kew Gardens and I saw a snowman. When I saw that snowman I immediately inferred that it must have been made by a human being. I didn't for a moment think it was just a chance combination of different snowflakes that happened to fall into the shape of a snowman and then purely by luck a pine cone blew up and became a nose and another pair blew up and became the eyes and a few twigs blew in and became the arms of this snowman. No, I immediately inferred there was an intelligent agent behind it. And I could look around and I could see some other snowmen that were more primitive that I assumed were probably made by children, some that were more complex that were made perhaps by a group of adults all working together, bringing their combined intelligence. And so I can see this correlation between intelligence and level of complexity that can be produced by that intelligence when it's designing and making something. And then if I follow the argument of Socrates, if I look at something like a tree or a human body or a flower, some complex biological object, well, I infer an even greater intelligence must have been involved in designing and making them. And hence I infer the, the existence of a great powerful intelligence otherwise known as God. And that's an argument that has echoed down through the centuries and it's always struck people as very intuitive. Now it's because Darwin apparently has a response to this argument that enables biological complexity to be explained purely in terms of natural processes, in terms of blind natural processes that don't have any purpose, they don't have any foresight, there's no intelligence involved. They're just blind natural processes that happen and that build up complexity. And because this is such a powerful mechanism, the argument goes, it can explain all of biological complexity around us and thus we don't need God anymore. Well, in order to understand the power of that argument, let me just quickly explain to you the evolutionary process in very simple terms. This is Darwin's mechanism of natural selection. Here I have a little illustration for you. Here is my son's, my three-year-old son's Brio train set. And here is a circle made of eight different pieces. If I walked into the living room one morning and saw this on the floor, I would immediately infer that a human being had made this. Some intelligence had formed these eight pieces together to make a circle. 
The alternative would be that the toy box had just fallen over and just by chance all of these pieces had fallen into place to make the perfect circle. But I know that the chances of that are so low as to make that possibility negligible. And so I won't for a moment think that chance made this happen. I'll immediately infer a human being and intelligence was involved. But now just imagine we had a process and my brio patterns could reproduce. Perhaps the every so often the pieces of brio get shaken up and allowed to fall back down. And of course, this is the big difference between living organisms and things like brio train sets and snowmen, human beings, living organisms, bacteria, viruses, they reproduce. And this, Darwin pointed out, gives the opportunity for this mechanism of natural selection. And what natural selection does in this little illustration of my Brio train set. Let's imagine these are being shaken around. Every generation is a different shake of this, cha tra tra of this train set. And then imagine there's something that says if two pieces come together, then keep them together. Don't break them up when you next shake up the train set. And so these pieces could be together. It was quite unlikely that the two pieces would come together, but it's not so lucky that we can't believe it would happen. So this little bit of luck is needed and we have two pieces. And then perhaps after several more shakes of this train set, another piece gets attached. And so this gets built up and gradually, bit by bit, step by step, we build up this train set with eight pieces within it. Now we could never have believed that all of these eight pieces of the train set could have all fallen together in one go to make eight pieces. But if we break up the process into these steps, and if we have a selecting force that says if the train set gets a bit longer, then that's better, keep that. And if the train set reaches a loop, that's even better, keep that loop. Then we can see how, how these small incremental changes that aren't really very lucky, each of them, could come together to eventually build a structure which it would be highly unlikely to build up just in one, to make just in one go. And so, as people like Richard Dawkins explain, this process breaks down improbabilities. It takes the improbability of making one complex structure all at once and it says, no, I have lots of slightly improbable steps, each one of them credible, but as I build them up together by natural selection, I can explain the origin of complexity. And Richard Dawkins argues this is what makes atheism credible. He, he writes uh, that before Darwin, it would have been very difficult to be an atheist, but Darwin makes it possible to be an intellectually fulfilled atheist because of the mechanism of natural selection. And atheists like Richard Dawkins draw the contrast between chance and natural selection. And Dawkins says repeatedly in his book, The God Delusion, natural selection is not a matter of luck. Because you see, before Darwin, the only explanation that an atheist had for very complex entities in life was pure chance. And philosophers, philosophers who were opposed to Socrates were indeed making that very argument. The atomist philosophers like Democritus and Epicurus, they were arguing, well, the universe could be infinitely large and it could be infinitely old. And it could be that we just happen to be in that lucky place where a chance concatenation of, apple, of atoms happens to have made complex life forms but all they had to appeal to was chance. Not many people became atheists because it just seemed much, 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 much too lucky. How could we believe that such complex things came about by chance? I can't imagine that an eight piece train set could come about by chance. I can't imagine a snowman could come about by chance, let alone the complexity of the biosphere. But Darwin makes a difference because he removes a huge amount of luck from what's needed if you're an atheist. And by removing luck, he makes atheism credible. We now have a process that seems to explain biological complexity without resorting to huge amounts of luck. But I want to question that argument 
And here's why. It's because as an evolutionary biologist, I know that huge amounts of luck are needed to make complex life forms by the Darwinian process. And I think Richard Dawkins plays this down rather too much in his famous book, The God Delusion. He repeatedly says natural selection is not a matter of luck. Now, as an evolutionary biologist, I agree with him. Natural selection is not a matter of luck. But the Darwinian process involves more than just natural selection. And we often talk about the five forces of evolution. They are mutation, the random changes that generate diversity in the first place, natural selection, recombination, which is the reshuffling of reshuffling of information in sexual reproduction, migration, which is movement of genetic variants in and out of different geographic areas, and also a process called drift. And drift is pure chance driving changes in gene frequencies. And all of those five different forces come together in the Darwinian mechanism as we understand it today. Now, notice only one of the five is natural selection, but sometimes the term natural selection is used to refer to the whole of that process. And Richard Dawkins tends often to use it to refer to the whole of that evolutionary process. And so for me as a biologist, I can read him saying, well, natural selection is not a matter of luck. And I think, well, that's true. But then there's when he's applying that to the whole of the evolutionary process, it's not true because random mutation needs a great deal of luck and genetic drift involves chance by definition. And also recombination is something that's um, affected a great deal by luck as well. And migration also can be affected by luck. And so luck is a really important part of the evolutionary process. And let, let me give you a little illustration of how you need luck to build up a complex entity. Now, just imagine I, I had this circle, I, I built it up by a gradual evolutionary process. But now imagine that I wanted something a bit more complex than just a circle. Well, to get that, I would need to include a junction. I need a junction to come in to my little structure here, and that opens up a whole range of new possibilities. But to get that junction in there, if I start out with just eight curves, I need to remove one and then put in this junction. Now, in order to remove one and put in that junction, I need to go backwards a step. I have to make my circle shorter. I have to break the loop in order to introduce a new piece. Now, natural selection can't drive that because I have to go back in terms of the desirability of my structure before I go forward. And natural selection does not have foresight. Natural selection can't say, well, look, let's go backwards because that will open up new possibilities and allow us to go forwards. And so only chance can allow me to go backwards a step in order to then go forwards. In other words, genetic drift is needed to get from one fitness peak to a different situation that will enable me to go to a higher fitness peak if we put it in in those kinds of terms. And more and more biologists are realising drift is a very important part of the evolutionary process and it's driven by chance. It's something that's very lucky. I mentioned also that mutation is a matter of luck. To get these different changes, to get in our illustration the pieces falling into place together, you have to be quite lucky for that to happen. Now imagine if you don't just need one mutation in order to make something that is better than what you had before, but several mutations in a row. And take, for example, in, in my Brio set, this bridge. Now, this bridge is made up of three different pieces. And so if I have my train set and by chance this piece comes into play, well, in order to get anything meaningful from that, I can't just have any old piece. I can't have this piece landing here because I'll, I'll have a non-functional piece of track. What I need is, is this piece to come in. And then also, once I've got that, I need the other little ramp at the end as well. And that enables me to build up a functional unit. So I need three things to fall into place by chance, one after the other. 
Now that takes a huge amount of luck to get three mutations all in a row in order to build up a more complex structure. And it's very hard to imagine that the complex proteins that drive the life processes in our living cells would not at least sometimes need strings of two or three or even four or five mutations all to fall into place at once or in very quick succession before a gain in desirability or a gain in fitness can actually be seen. Again, a great deal of luck is needed. So the evolutionary process does need lots of luck, even granted the power of Darwinian natural selection. And I'm afraid that Dawkins does tend to sweep that a little bit under the carpet. Now, I could belabor this point uh, a great deal. I, there's, there's a lot of things I could say about the amount of luck that's needed in the evolutionary processes, in the evolutionary process. And, and some evolutionary biologists like uh, Michael Lynch have even argued that in things with small population sizes like mammals, natural selection would actually be incredibly weak. And natural selection is only really powerful in huge populations of things like COVID-19 viruses or bacteria. In a small population, drift is expected to predominate as an evolutionary force, therefore chance is responsible for almost every change that we see. I could go on and on about this, but I'd be belabouring the point because I have something else that I have to say from Richard Dawkins' own argument within his book, The God Delusion. Although he plays down um, the amount of chance needed in, in the evolutionary process, there are a few instances where he's willing to concede he needs massive doses of pure luck. And that comes in particularly in the issue of the origin of life and the origin of the eukaryotic cell, that cells that have nucleuses and different compartments within them um, doing some very complex things. And also in the origin of, com of consciousness. He admits that he needs massive amounts of luck um, to enable these to happen. And the origin of life is an especially important example. Because the Darwinian process relies on having replicating entities. Until you have replication, natural selection can't happen. So how do we get the first replicator? Well, that's a very difficult problem. And Dawkins has to fall back on the argument of saying, well, it was pure chance. We were just very, very lucky. And he even finds himself reiterating the arguments that were made by the atomist philosophers long, long before Darwin lived. He says, well, perhaps there are lots and lots of planets that are capable of supporting complex life forms and we just happen to be the lucky ones on that planet. And so that's how he gets away with this huge invocation of luck. So he's falling back on arguments made by philosophers long before Darwin lived. But his argument is, is weaker than theirs was because they thought that the universe could be infinitely large and infinitely old. But today, we know that in fact the universe had a beginning and we know that it's finite in size. So Richard Dawkins doesn't have as many planetary opportunities available to him as the Greek atomists thought that they had. His probabilistic resources are much lower than theirs. And so not only does he find himself in a situation of having to fall back on arguments that atheists had to make before Darwin, but he's doing so in a weaker form than they had available to them back then. And so when we step back and we think about all this and say, well, did Darwin really make such a big difference for atheists? Yes, we can see how in certain circumstances he seems to reduce the amount of luck that is needed to make complex structures, that is true. On the other hand, we're still demanding huge doses of luck in order to make all of this work. So this is why I argue that we need more than just the Darwinian process. We need more than evolution. Darwin doesn't make atheism credible. Now that's a very brief overview and I'm sure there are many areas where I could have been misunderstood. 
but I hope that that's a good starting point and please do continue to think about these questions and do get in touch with me if you want any clarification on anything that I've been saying. Thank you.